Welcome back to So Very Wrong About Games. It is a podcast about board gaming. I'm here with my great friend, Mark. How are you today, Mark? I'm very well, Walker. How are you? I'm good. This The COVID shipping has started again. Chinese New Year is finally over. We've been getting shipping notices for all our late Kickstarters and whatnot, and lots of games coming in, so lots of games to be played. And now that we're actually getting some a little bit of in-person gaming in, things are looking up. Cautious optimism. <laughs> Cautious, limited optimism, while at the same time, solidarity and sympathy for those who are not similarly blessed. Thank you for throwing a wet blanket on me. This is a podcast where we talk about board games. We're going to talk about some games we played this week. We're going to talk about board gaming news and why it really doesn't matter. Then we're going to talk about our feature game this week, which is Project Elite I guess we could say, it never doesn't say second edition anywhere, but it really is. It's Project Elite second edition. Effectively, yeah. By Simon Games. Words are meaningless. We can just call things That's whatever true. we want, Walker. Can I call you Sally? You can. Just don't call me late for supper. Wow. I can't believe you just said that. <laughs> <laughs> well. I feel as though you've just aged all our listeners about 40 I, years I, with I that know. utterance. It's It's pretty bad. We're going to call it. Project Elite Teddy Bear Edition. So, Mark, what did you play this week? Played Hour of Need again. This is the demo that is available on Tabletop Simulator. And we are big fans of Adam Sadler and Brady Sadler at Blacklist Games. And I stand by what I said previously about Hour of Need. This has the potential, when played in person, to be perhaps the best distillation of some of the variability and complexity that you get in a game of Street Masters, but at the same time with a greater degree of playability that you might expect from something more like Sentinels of the Multiverse, which is the progenitor of Street Masters. Because as I constantly say, Street Masters is one of my favorite co-op games, but at times it borders on a little bit too much to manage. But Hour of Need manages with some very, very clever abstractions to simultaneously give you more latitude in what you do in your turn while at the same time simplifying things and it's a really impressive job i will say though that as we played with new characters i've been very very disappointed with a lot of the art uh, as presented in the demo version a lot of characters in the demo version don't have any art at all but some of the characters are very much of the standard comic book style art which is to say uh, all the women are contorted so you can see simultaneously their chest and their butt and they fly chest forward in a very, very strange and awkward way. And I know this because when I play a game and I see a, uh, some card art and I think, hmm, that seems borderline. I don't really know if that's, uh, that, that, that seems to be uh, pushing it. And then our good friend Louis, who is a marvelous human being, can re be relied on to make some sort of comment that is uh, objectifying about the women involved in the artwork. He's a great guy, but he's the one who's reliably going to say something like that. And sure enough, we're playing Hour of Need and there was the Superman and stand in whose name is majesty and i was thinking uh, i mean i get it superhero genre everything has to be skin tight i guess but some of Aer the Aer aerodynamic mark exactly some of the posing wasn't great and, so, and sure enough louis was like oh I, I i like the way she looks i'm like okay here we go and so anyway and this is this is despite the fact that adam and brady, uh, brady sadler have been very very clear about their priorities, even in the context of our need of representing women in a non-objectified way. And so I think there's a sort of mismatch of their priorities and my expectations. And hopefully the final product, especially with a full roster, will have a slightly more balanced presentation. But we'll see. I'm very much looking forward to Hour of Need. I'm looking forward to trying Alter Quest when it comes out. But everything that Adam and Brady Sadler do is the very least interesting. And I'm a big fan of their output. And I very much enjoyed another playing of Hour of Need. You and I, Mark, played a game called Inhuman Conditions. It's web-published by Tommy... Morangis. Morangis and Corey O'Brien. This is a fantastic game, Mark. If you're into any sort of role-playing or, you know, role selection or hidden deduction games, this is something you need to try out. One person is a sort of investigator, a sort of... Blade Runner. Blade sorry. Runner. Sorry, Blade Runner, Harrison Ford-type character where you call in... The, the prospective interviewer and you're to find out whether they're a robot, either they're going to be aggressive, violent robot, or they're going to be a patient robot, or they're going to be a human. And you get to ask whatever questions you like, and they give you like a little outline, and the robot and or human player, they have to hit certain bullet points that are on their card, and I think overall it just is a very well done, very thematic game. 
In Human Conditions, which we should note is a review copy sent to us by Tommy Moranges, is an audacious design. It's a two-player a social deduction game, a genre which has previously been thought to be more, more or less impossible, or at least funny. Uh, Who is the Banana, for example, is a two-player social deduction game, which is pretty funny, but it is meant to be kind of silly. I hope I'm not offending anybody by calling Who is the Banana kind of silly. It is indeed a replication of the Voight Comp test in Blade Runner, and it's got this marvelous veneer of bureaucracy about it. You know, the Euro fills out a form, there's a, a sort of formality to everything and there's a canned speech they give at the beginning to put the person at ease saying like look if you've got nothing to hide everything's going to be fine let's just run through this you know let me i just got to fill out the form state your name for the record etc etc and it's one of those games where the specific details the specific minutia can be a little bit hard to grok unless you've got the components out in front of you but at the core either the person's a human or they're a robot and if they're a robot they have to do a series of i would say conversational ticks while getting away with it and it's really the sort of distillation of social deduction and improv and role-playing in a mix that I find absolutely delicious. I, I'm somewhat confused when some people point to Inhuman Conditions and say, well, you know, it's not really much of a board game. It's more of a, a role-playing game. And I'm like, sure, but having played many, many rounds of Deception, Murder in Hong Kong or Secret Hitler, which Tommy Morandis was also involved in designing, or The Resistance, some element of role-play always comes into it. Not like, I'm going to give myself a new name and a new identity, but sometimes even that. I've seen people really take to that, and how far you lean into that is is a, a, a matter of course. In The Resistance, you might be a spy. You are role-playing as a member of The Resistance, but you're actually a spy, and so you have to put on a certain kind of conversational set of gambits in order to pass. Similarly, in Inhuman Conditions, it's more about these conversational gambits in order to pass. It's really tense in a good way, but tense in a way that might alienate some people. It's very quick. It's only five minutes long. It's set to a timer. And the goal is just to have a conversation. And again, as a robot, you have to fulfill some ticks in order to pass. And as a human, you want to sound human. So it's a weird kind of Turing test in that sense. I've only played it a small number of times. There's a whole bunch of different modules and a whole bunch of different prompts within the modules to play through. It is a marvelously beautiful production. It yeah, comes with those stamps. I was about to say that too. Yeah, the the production value is amazing. Much like Secret Hitler, they just went over the top. Like you said, they have little stamps that are there for the the investigator, and they're going to punch the form. You know, you could go all out and say, you know, excuse me, sir, I'll be right back. You know, because you might you might, might think it's the violent robot, and you don't want him to kill you on the way out because he's found you out. So they found you out. They found you. Just you know, relax, sir, in, in your seat, and uh, I'll be right back. Don't mind the big thugs that are coming in to escort you. <laughs> Everything will be okay. Well, as an indication of how these components really feed into the overall atmosphere of the game, if an investigator falsely identifies a human as a robot, they're expected to stamp their inner wrist as a mark of their shame for accidentally sending a human over to processing. And it's the same publication model, by the way, that they have adopted for Secret Hitler and also for the second edition of Pax Pamir. That is to say, it is published under the Creative Commons license. It's freely available. They've committed to make it always freely available. If you want to buy it, you will get a gorgeous production that really adds to the experience. And I'm a big fan of that production model. I'm a big fan of the game. I'm a big fan of the way they've approached it. And I am looking forward to future experiences with Inhuman, Condition, Inhuman Conditions. And I'm very glad that you enjoy it, too. Got to play a game called Crazy Tower. Now, the more we seem to play this, the more it seems to be fantastic. It seems to just thrive on the more players that we play it with. It's simply a Tetris block stacking game where you can, where there is, there is, the, in the very limited rules there is, there's this like strategy of manipulating the cards in a certain way to make it very hard for the next player to play their blocks. And, and, and it has these interesting abilities that if you cover them up, I think they could have done a little bit better job at making them more interesting. But I think overall, I think it's a fantastic game for what it is. So as I've commented frequently over the years, I think that where even quality enjoyable dexterity games fall is their victory conditions. Sometimes they don't quite work. Uh, for example, Rhino Hero Super Battle is one of my favorite simple dexterity games and is very visually arresting. But the victory conditions are incredibly arbitrary and unsatisfying. The ones where the victory conditions actually work, games like Loop and Louie, when you play by the tournament rules as designed by Josephus and Woogie, or co-op games like the only game that matters, Seal Team Flicks, those are the dexterity games that really work. So we played Crazy Tower, colon, construction slash sabotage, which is an awkward name. I played it twice now, and I very much enjoyed it. 
I felt that the victory conditions didn't make a whole lot of sense. I felt that the special powers were uh, incredibly unfair and unbalanced. And then I decided to do something that I really should do more often whenever you teach a game to me. I read the rules. Because reading is what? Fundamental. And I discovered that the sort of default game mode is the semi-co-op one versus all mode. And suddenly a lot of things started to make more sense. Because what's interesting about Crazy Tower and what I felt that the game didn't really leverage was there were a series of incentives both to play conservatively and to play aggressively. But they were sometimes working at cross-purposes. But when you play in the semi-co-op mode, which I haven't tried yet, and which I think I will insist, if you are willing, next time we play to play this, one person's job is the saboteur. And this isn't hidden or anything. This is not a social deduction experience. Their job is to make sure that the tower falls not on their turn. Whereas the job of everyone else at the table is to make sure that the tower does not fall, or if it does fall, falls during the saboteur's turn. But there's only one saboteur, so the odds of that are are not particularly good. So one group of players is playing conservatively, and one player is playing aggressively. Now suddenly, these cross-purposes make sense. Now suddenly, the arbitrary nature of the powers doesn't seem so problematic, uh, problematic, and the multiplayer rules now don't have these victory condition problems. So I really want to play the game as published. Your version is fun, your version is cute, but it's not as engaging aging is what I think the actual published version may be. But then your tower would be so boring. It'd be all like stable and and straight and stuff. Yeah, so the game that normally gets to an unstable wild tower in two minutes will now get to a wild and unstable tower in three minutes. How will we deal with the extra 60 seconds of tedium, Walker? I don't know. It'll be painful at first, but I guess this is this is designed by a team. Alexis Harvey, Felix LeBlanc, Manuel Lucas Bergeron, Donnell, Matthew Auger, and it's put out by Synapsis Games. I'll let that pronunciation stand, but yes. for the record, I will lodge my objections. We also played Fantastic Factories. You've been talking about this a couple of times. This is something that you bought on the strength of its art, and its art does indeed... It very much looks like it was a mobile game in terms of the overall graphic design of the art. And it's kind of sort of a tableau builder with a very, very minor dice placement. And uh, I have to say it did nothing for me. No, it was. It definitely has. It has a solo element that I think played much better when I played it solo than it did with other people. It definitely I is see. super light and not super engaging. But if you're just there by yourself, you know, knocking it out, it it wasn't so bad. So there are two resources in the game. There is energy and there's metal. And in order to put out cards, in order to build your tableau, you need varying quantities of both. In order to power your cards, you need varying quantities of both. And the trick is, I I haven't crunched the probabilities, but it actually seems relatively common. Sometimes you're going to have a shortage of one or the other, energy or metal. And in the early to mid game, especially if you don't have any conversion powers, and every conversion power you build is effectively the opportunity cost of another victory point generating engine that you don't build, you're going to face serious shortages. For the early part of the game, I had energy that I was literally wasting because I couldn't carry it over from turn to turn because literally the dice would not give me any metal. This was not a function of my earlier choices. This is purely just you roll your worker dice. Oh, look, you didn't roll a four or higher. You don't get any metal. Sucks to be you. And then in the mid game, I had only metal and no energy. And again, this was purely a function of what the dice gave to me. And in conjunction with a relatively unsatisfying multiplayer solitaire tableau builder thing, it really didn't do anything for me. It's got these lovely, chunky dual-layer boards on which to slot your dice. But again, it's just if you roll a 1, 2, or 3, you sock that die for energy. If you roll a 4, 5, or 6, you sock that die for metal. Once those are full, maybe you might want to get some cards. And that's pretty much it. It was a Kickstarter, so I think it just got, like, deluxified up to a point where... Don't use that word, Walker. You know that's a trigger word for me. Please don't use that word. (laughs) Yeah, like, it was cute. It was quick. It was relatively inoffensive. But, oh, my gosh, it was derivative and uninspired. And the luck... The the, the dice didn't add to the game. They only detracted from the game. And, quite frankly, there's a million and one tableau builders that do the job better. I would rather... I can't believe I'm saying this. I'd rather play Wingspan than than play this again. Whoa. I know, I know. Wow. This is a game by Joseph Z. Chen and... Justin Faulkner from Metafactory Games. I have to say, I don't think it was fantastic. It was not, but it had, like I said, it has a great solo variant. I would, if you had a chance to try it, I would definitely do it. On the, on the key of terrible solo variants, uh, I played Fujikoro solo, and it, this is a, a game by Jerome Dreadmire, put out by Game Brewer, and I don't think it really f- it, uh, played well solo. Because in the very little interaction that there was when we played multiplayer, there was that sort of, I don't want to say it was huge, tense, but, you know, 
worry worrying about whether they're going to take that monk that you wanted or taking the resources before you could get them or killing the dragon before you could and when you're playing solo none of that is there it's just you slogging around you know killing these you know phantom npcs and overall it was not a fun experience compared to the normal game fujikaro i suspect this is off the strength of two plays is one of those games that's really riding the knife edge because if you're playing solo All you're doing is this mechanical tile flipping and going through the motions of uninspired, relatively rote combat and sort of red herring of crafting, which isn't really a crafting system. It's just, you know, acquire cubes. But when you're playing multiplayer, the downtime at least gives you a break from the purely mechanical element of that. But at the same time, that's just a distraction from the fact that you're not playing. And so I wonder (laughs) if all of this is to say that there's not really much of anything to Fujikoro other than perhaps watching pretty components fly around. I, I wouldn't want to be that cynical, though. I would never be so uncharitable as to say that Fujikoro is basically a, a shallow exercise of deception, trying to make you think that you're doing something of consequence when really all you're doing is wandering around gathering cubes. You would never do that. Never in a million years. So you said that there are multiple solo scenarios to Fujikoro, and you played the one where you had to go and three, defeat three guardians? Correct, yes. They okay. want you to put out all the components and... and and build all the weapons of three other characters. Did you actually do that, or did you just build... Of course I didn't. I built nothing. I just simply put out the cards and just manipulated the resources to, you know, if I attack them, I, you know, just mark how much damage they took or looked at the card to see how many dice I would roll if they attacked me instead of spending the 15 to 20 minutes setting up three full boards. Good call. We played another game of Flick Wars. This time we played the advanced rules with three players on the topic of dexterity games often living or dying by how their victory conditions work. And I have to say that the multiplayer rules of Flick Wars are among the better multiplayer conflict rules that I've encountered. It's not quite as good as Kemet, which I think is still the the benchmark for multiplayer free-for-all conflict game working properly, where A and B fighting doesn't lead to C winning by default. Even the great Reiner Knizia in his Clash of the Gladiators designed a mostly functional multiplayer free-for-all battle game, but it still had the whole last hit problem. I attack a monster that I should be able to kill in one round. I don't kill it in one round. The player to my left laughs uproariously and goes and gets the last kill and wins. Flick Wars uh, obviates this because you're only able to kill one player's pieces, and so another player can serve as a blocker without having to worry about necessarily being predated on in consequence. I have to say, though, that I found the the session that we played a little less satisfying. We played with the advanced rules, and the advanced rules you get to pick your own units, and I think that we all collectively... Individually, I think the decisions we made were reasonable, but collectively, the sum total of all our decisions led to an unfortunately just slightly overlong, a little bit too finicky game because we all picked short range units that required a high degree of skill. So there was a lot of missing going on. That's right. There was, we, a lot, there was a lot of running away. It's like, well, my first flick went terribly. I will now run to the corner. Absolutely. And I think that when you are not as skilled at flicking, you really need to pay attention to those units that have range two or three. I picked a series of units that I thought were interesting, and then only afterwards I looked down and said, this is this is a group of units for someone who's good at flicking games. This is probably not going to work out terribly well for me. And sure enough, it did not, because you needed to be very, very precise with the units that I picked, and I really should have looked at the ones that let you be a little bit sloppy, or at least have one unit available that let you be a little bit sloppy. And we all pretty much chose uh, chose units like that. I still had a great time. I enjoyed it. I think that shaving 15 to 20 minutes off the playtime would have been yet better. And I think that with now a little bit more experience with the system, I'll be able to pick units slightly more intelligently and be able to counsel other people to pick units slightly more intelligently. But the fact that it is a solid flicking game, a solid dexterity game, with victory conditions that work and that mostly solve most but not all of the multiplayer conflict game problems is really a, a, an excellent achievement. So it's very expensive for a dexterity game, but we are aficionados of dexterity games, and so that is that is definitely fine for us. And you do get a lot of value. Six fully playable factions, a giant neoprene mat, lovely wooden hemispheres as terrain. So I'm very satisfied with Flick Wars. I'm very ple- I've been very pleasantly surprised with it. It's a very solid system, and I'm looking forward to future playing. I definitely want to try out some of the other factions. The other thing that the advanced game does is it takes out... One main part of other flicking games, which is what I would like to call the power shot. You see, (laughs) in other flicking games, you can just drive your piece across the board and, you know, 
come what may, you know, you're going to drive through that piece. And as long as you hit it, you're good. But in how Flicking Wars works, if you knock your piece or you knock your opponent's piece off the board, then it stays off the board for that entire round until your turn is done. And then they come back on the board. So if you do a movement to try to get close to your opponent and you accidentally knock him off the board, well, now you can't attack him because he's off the board. They, yes. Same thing with your piece. If you've knocked it off the board, then it's out for the rest of the round and you have to wait for it to come back. But other than that, looking forward to playing more factions. If you want a picture of frustration, dear listeners, all you have to do is explain to Michael Walker that you're going to play a dexterity game that requires precision and finesse rather than hitting something as hard as he possibly can. It was painful. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, for me, I finally got to play Big City with... Uh, more than just one player. I played once two player. Now we play with four. Did you play Big City or did you play the Big City 20th Anniversary Jumbo Edition? Jumbo Maximum Edition with huge pizzas. And it was hated by all. And I have to say that I too did not enjoy it probably just as much as everybody else. I have to say that the table presence of this game is over the top, amazing. It looks great, but it definitely, the proof is in the name, 20th Edition. 20th year, it's 20 years old, <laughs> and it really shows that it's 20 years old. I liked it more than I thought it, well, I was going to like it. Hate it is a strong word. I didn't hate it. I actually kind of enjoyed the playing, primarily because, as you say, the table presence was remarkable. There have been lots of city building games or games that claim to be city building games. We played Small City, we played Suburbia, we played a, a whole bunch of other such things, and they tend just to be relatively pedestrian tiling things. And even when they're good, they don't really get to look like a city. But I have to say, the relatively straightforward building conditions and scoring requirements of Big City lead to something that kind of sort of looks like a city. And that's kind of amazing. That's kind of remarkable. And and it's it's kind of disappointing in hindsight that I haven't really experienced that much with other city building games. The pieces have to be really seen in play to fully appreciate how beautiful they are. Because in conjunction with all the other pieces and in person, it really is visually striking. Now, would I pay $327,000 for it as you did? Probably not. But you definitely see where the money went. And the aspect of hand management I thought was neat. The luck of the draw was considerable. Sometimes you just luck into a series of adjacent properties and that's wonderful. But you do have the opportunity to build up towards those cards when no one else is fishing through them. The game starts with a certain number of districts and you can start drawing cards for districts that don't exist yet. and Try to corner the market on them before it shows up and that's kind of cute. I kind of sort of liked some of the rounds of drafting. There's this mandatory end of round thing, which saps the tempo right out of the game, but nonetheless offers for some potentially interesting card trading. So in theory, I like that. In practice, I liked it only about half the time. And I, you know, I'm usually a sucker for, for decent hand management. And there were sometimes elements of that. I would look down at my hand and say, oh, I actually have to get rid of some of these because I painted myself into a corner. Now I have to engage in triage. So those aspects I thought were nice. But I thought at the end of the day, it was a little bit too luck dependent, a little bit longer than it wanted to be, and a little bit too much arbitrary screwage. You know, just, I don't have anything better to do with my turn, so I'll just place this train here, which I know will prevent anyone from building in this location, and there's nothing you can do to stop them. Especially since many of the very, very high power buildings have incredibly specific conditions. Not difficult to remember, but very, very precise. And so you look at that hole and everyone looks at that space in the board and says, oh, there's only one thing that could go there. I'm never going to build it. Oh, well, I'll make sure no one else can. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is the third time I've had this factory in my hand. So, well, guess what? Plunk. And there goes someone's, you know, six turns of of planning down the tube. Precisely. Like I said, I, I love... I, I say I did show its age. I I I think most of my dislike for the our session was I could see that everyone else was struggling and not enjoying themselves as much as I wish they had been. I see. Well, perhaps you were mistaken. We were playing with Huey and Dewey. Maybe your misapprehension of my experience was the same as your misapprehension of their experiences. Maybe we should actually ask them what they think about things rather than telling them what they think about things. I don't want to get their bibs any wetter than they usually are. Uh, That's true. That might set a bad precedent. We don't want to encourage that. That's right. Yeah, okay. So those are the games we played last week. Now on to the news and why it doesn't matter. So Ryan Courtney and Capstone Games put out Pipeline last year. They're coming out with a sort of, I don't want to say it's a two-player version, but it's a two-player game that looks very much like Pipeline. It's a game called Curious Cargo and 
Mark, I'm curious about this cargo. You seem far too pleased with yourself. I am very pleased with myself. It was fantastic. I do want to take a check it out. It looks very interesting. We only got to very lightly brush with, at least I, only got a light brush with Pipeline. I definitely want to return to it and, and, and dive a little deeper into it. But this two-player version looks very interesting. So in the case of bad timing, Pandemic Hot Zone, the stripped down, quicker, leaner, meaner version of Pandemic, has been in the works for quite some time. It was supposed to be released this summer. It was delayed for obvious reasons, and it's going to be released June 31st. But in the interim, Z-Man Games has made available on their website a full print-and-play version of Pandemic Hot Zone. And if you already have some of the components from other versions of Pandemic, like cubes and pawns and such, well then, you're well on your way. And in point of fact, you can take most of the cards. And you have a more portable... Leaner, tighter pandemic. I haven't tried it yet, but largely because Walker has declared that he is done with normal pandemic and will never have any pandemic that does not involve roam falling ever again. And that's fine. It's okay. But I'm curious about the design. I went and read the rules. It looks like a fascinating reimagining of the thing, and it will be available on July 31st. But if you want to try it now and print and play, you can go and do that. That's Pandemic Hot Zone. So Priazzo has put out games like Pathfinder. They have some fantastic deck games, and they have a huge role-playing system they have another role-playing game called starfinder and they're putting out a whole because we just recently talked about pre-painted figures so they're putting out a whole line of pre-painted figures for this starfinder rpg so that's kind of interesting and exciting news they have pictures already up they look fairly fantastic and i'm looking forward to seeing you know because you can sub them in for all sorts of things because it's like a role-playing game so they're gonna have all sorts of different funky aliens and such, so check it out. Yeah, there have been uh, pre-painted Pathfinder miniatures for some years now. In other quasi-role-playing news, Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, a sort of intro e version of Gloomhaven with, instead of effectively infinite amount of content, merely a finite amount of content, is a mysteriously enough Target exclusive and has been released, much to the chagrin of many people who can't find it because Target is very much out of stock because we gamers are voracious and we'll go find it. But I will po point out, not only is this more Gloomhaven, which is, I think, one of the best designs of the past 20 years, but is also a, a real watershed moment for mass market big box retailing and board games. I never would have imagined, five years ago, maybe even two years ago, I never would have imagined a game like Gloomhaven going to Target, much less it being a Target exclusive. And yet here we are. It's a brave new world, and were the border open, I would definitely go and get a copy, but the border's not open, so I can't. It's got that fantastic thing we talked about where you open up the rule book and the map is there. You don't have to set up tiles or anything. It's all there. You play right on the book. I would just want it for the new classes. I yeah. love Gloomhaven classes. I love exploring new Gloomhaven classes. It's got four new classes, which is a ton of content all by itself. Early reports are somewhat positive, except, of course, <clears throat> there are some minor rule changes in the AI. It's not entirely certain whether those changes were deliberate or not. And uh, so, naturally, there are 17 threads on BoardGameGeek already. Probably the just very to, Hopefully, they were probably trying to make it a little more streamlined. So, we'll see how that worked out. Yeah. So, Mark, you and I, we love roll and write games. This new no. genre of roll and write Stop is fantastic. Lying. And we love flicking games. So, the merger of you both. Don't get, no, no, no. Slow down. Merger. Slow down. You don't get to follow yes, I do. up a I am, lie. I'm doing it right now. A truth uh, immediately after a lie in the same tone of voice with the same cadence and an and, and enunciation that's no it's i just did it okay so you combine them both together and you get a flicking roll flicking and write game it does not sound super fun i it's I, called i think i gave up on sonora. fun about 20 seconds ago maybe it's S sonora like snore snore you're snoring i, I don't know it's coming up by pandasaurus games and you, so it's f flick and write walker it's flicking right it is. I told you about this game months ago. No, this one's by Rob Newton. Walker, I told you about this game months ago. No, you didn't. This is new. I just saw it. No one else knows about it. It's a Michael Walker exclusive. I told you about this game months ago. <laughs> Did you? Sorry, I don't have a very good memory, Mark. I'm old. Oh, dear Lord. So lastly from me, there's a game called Battleground Fantasy Warfare that I have yet to try. And it's always had good buzz. I've always wanted to try it. It is a... It's not bad. It is like sort of like a fantasy skirmish. I don't want to say skirmish. Not skirmish. Sorry. It's, it's, big tabletop. Slightly more of a mass battle game, yeah. Mass battle game, but it's all done with cards. And they have a Kickstarter going right now for Lords of Valshold faction. 
And of course it has all the tiers where you can get the new faction with, you know, several other factions or all of the factions. And it's, it's something to check out. I used to live effectively the next town over from where the publisher ran shop. They used to have a board game store and then they became a publisher for this product in Somerville. Uh, and back when I lived in Cambridge and uh, I'd always wanted to, to go give it a shot in, you know, in, in the belly of the beast as it were. And I never did try the game though. It's, it's a reasonably interesting system. You know, it's, it's one of those things that people have been trying to do for ages. You look at a game like Warhammer Fantasy Battle or even DBA or something like that or Hordes of the Things. And you say, look, you could replace these things with cards and everything would be fine. It's kind of like the transition from Wings of War to X-Wing, but in reverse. And you write on the units with dry erase markers, just as you do in Talon. And it's a really good way to get a miniature, a full, full-blown full miniatures game experience for about 20 bucks. Yeah, the, the Kickstarter is only 25 bucks for that one deck or 50 bucks for two starter decks and you'll be good to go. So on the topic of tabletop miniatures wargaming... I would like to paraphrase Chris Rock and say, I love historical war games, but I'm tired of defending them. And the wargaming community, and I don't want to paint everyone with this broad brush, but the wargaming community has been, shall we say, home to a number of very problematic features. And one of them is a certain set of potted historical narratives. If you want to find a whole bunch of guys, and I do mean guys, talking about how colonialism wasn't that bad and how the British weren't really, were really a great influence on the rest of the world. And, you know, maybe the Southern cause in the American Civil War was, was really full of noble, patriotic individuals and a whole bunch of discussion about the Wehrmacht and, and detailed elements of the SS. Historical wargaming is a great community for you in a number of ways. I don't mean to disparage everyone involved, but I've seen some truly toe-curling stuff. And it is under this category that I would like to talk about, generally speaking, some of the fallout from board games' response to Black Lives Matter. We put out our statement online, and we're not going to dwell on it because we think that silence is unacceptable, but at the same time, we are not going to waste your time going into detailed elements of politics. But I will point out this. Consum World, which is kind of sort of one of the clearinghouse message boards for historical wargaming, has done worse than been silent because a number of publishers have been silent. Cool Mini or Not was silent. GMT Games is silent. And as a result, they've lost Scott Muldoon, designer of the Fascinating Cataclysm. He says he's not going to work with them anymore because if you're not willing to say the simple, obvious truth that Black Lives Matter, he doesn't want to do business with you. And I respect that decision. Consum World has done worse than be silent. They are suppressing anybody who even puts Black Lives Matter in their profile name. On the grounds that this is just a place to talk about historical war games, not a place to talk politics. Which is so absurd on its face that I think it only needs to be said to be recognized. These are people who, like me, sometimes pretend to be Nazis in games. And the only way you get to do that and not be contemptible is to talk politics, is to acknowledge the political reality of what you're talking about. These are people who have historical arguments about the Reformation, about military campaigns, about the political causes of, of a million different things. But, oh, they would never talk politics. That's absurd. If you want to talk about how great the British were, that's not politics. But if you want to talk, if you want to say that black people are deserving of fundamental human rights, oh, that's controversy in politics. Honestly, it's that degree of hypocrisy, which is one of the reasons why silence is effectively tacit consent, and one of the reasons why we felt uh, moved to comment. And I'm I'm disgusted at the fact that Consum World has been taking this editorial stance in silencing even just people putting it in their profile names. There's tons of hypocrisy everywhere. I'd also have to call out Board Game Geek, for example. They went into our house, they went into our guild, and they, I think, somewhat heavy-handedly moderated some people who... I disagree with, but weren't saying things that were completely out of bound. But by the same token, and I've brought this to their attention many times over the years, you can get a micro badge on Board Game Geek that will proudly display the text and logo of the Washington professional football team, which is a racial slur. So if you show up on Board Game Geek and say, you know, I have some concerns about the Black Lives Matter movement, you are going to have your text banned, but oh, proudly display a racial slur and ethnic caricatures in your micro badges anyway. It's this level of hypocrisy, which is one of the reasons why I think we need to talk a little bit more about the political and cultural context of the games involved. And Walker wanted me to shut up two, two minutes no, ago. I, so I'll stop. I, am, I am just scared to say anything. It's just, I'm going to say that I did talk to you about the censorship on board game geek. And the only part I'm worried about is if people don't see these comments, maybe they don't understand that there's a problem. If they see these people 
commenting these foolish things or outrageous things, they're not going to understand that there's a problem out there that needs to be addressed. And that's all I'm going to say. Clearly, there's a line to be drawn. And I agree with you, though, on general free speech grounds that it is all things being equal preferable to let someone say the wrong thing than to suppress all discussion. But moving on, let us proceed to our feature game of the week. What is our feature game, Walker? Feature game is Project Elite by Simon Games and Artipia Games. Project Elite was first published in 2016 by Artipia Games. They had a Kickstarter where the fulfillment was, shall we say, rather troubled. It took them a long time to fulfill. Some people, I think, might still not be made whole. There was a huge problem with the initial print run of miniatures because the uh, original miniatures were very, very blobby and blocky, even by the standards of most other miniatures games. But then... The first production run was a yet blobbier and yet blockier. This was Artipia's first experiences with miniatures on this scale, and by their account, they messed it up. And so they tried to make uh, replacement miniatures, but some people never even got the first wave. Anyway, it was a huge deal. Artipia Games is mostly known for its Among the Stars drafting game, and the designers of Project Elite were Konstantinos Kokinis and Soturios Tsantilas who had previously done New Dawn, which is kind of sort of the sequel to Among the Stars. So, Kuhlman or not said they were going to reprint it, by the same name, Project Elite, Marco Portugal, who is an in-house developer who's done some development work on a lot of their projects, is now the third listed designer. They kind of see it up. They did a Kickstarter that raised uh, over 600000 bucks a couple of years ago, and now it has been f- being fulfilled everywhere around the world. So, Walker, why don't you give us an unhelpful summary of what one does in Project Elite? I feel Project Elite is the closest thing to playtime with rules that there is. It's like, <laughs> it's army men for the big boys and you get to play on the same team. It's literally moving your little Marines around, killing aliens with such a light rule set. But Can we say grown-ups rather than big boys? Sorry, yes. Sorry, grown-ups. Sorry, yes. Grown-ups. Playtime for the grown-ups with our little toys. I don't know. I, I don't get that kind of visceral joy. Let me, let me put all my cards on the table. I like Project Elite. I don't love it. And I've spent the past week or so really trying to cement my views on it because we played the original version when we first had it a few years ago. And now we've played this new version. We'll we'll compare the two versions in a moment. But I've always felt that there was something lacking in the execution. I wanted, I've always wanted to like Project Elite more than I actually do. And I think one of the reasons why is I don't get this sort of exultant joy that you seem to get in terms of mowing down hordes of baddies. When I play a, when I play a game of Heroescape, I get that sense of toy factor. You know, I feel like it's playtime for grownups. I feel like I'm playing with my little dollies and I'm stomping around with big, with, with, with lots of big plastics. The toy factor is huge. When playing other games with big toy factors, lots of dexterity games, or even something like Big City, I feel like this is playtime for grownups. This, I get to play with these fun little things. I'm, I'm fiddling with the, the, the components off, off the side. But when I play Project Elite, I don't get that sense and I'll, I'll try to explain why that happens later. So it's a one to five player real time co-op dice game. And it's kind of sort of in the same vein of Escape Curse for the, Sem- the Temple or Escape Zombie City, where there's a timer and you're rolling the dice as fast as possible. Some dice results are bad. Most of them are good. And you're trying to achieve a goal collectively. And in that sense, one of the things I'd like to stress right away is that for me, when I play a real time dice game, it feels almost like a dexterity game. And this is actually somewhat high praise because we love dexterity games. Because rolling dice as fast as you can, even independently of executing those dice results, is very much a, a, a task of dexterity. And some people, like my friend Woogie, are able to roll dice with such speed and grace. Honestly, I sometimes just lose myself in real-time dice games. I just want to watch him roll the dice because he randomizes them properly, but he just kind of tosses them in the air gently, and they roll so quickly. Anyway, it's beautiful. That's one thing I wanted to flag right away. So I sort of broke this down into, like, set up, and then the turn, like as in like a turn sequence to make it. So during the setup, you don't have to build the board. Like there's a small expansion where you build the board, but this is just one big game board they lay out both sides. So it's nice and fast. There's an event deck that you have to build, which is my only negative part of this game. It is a bit tedious to it's sort out all this, the event cards. You know, and... they're all numbered one through 30 or whatever. And I think just like an afternoon of the developers sitting down together could have made a better system, like just color coded the faces, like. And they could have said, you know, draw two from green, four from purple, and one from red, and then shuffle them together. Keep the backs all the same, but just something instead of, you know, sorting them all by number and 
picking them out. Three random cards from 1 to 16, cards 23 and 24, two random cards from this. Yeah, I agree. So this being said, what the event deck does is that you, you, when you're all done, you shuffle it all together and you start flipping up and they give you little penalties if either they might be right away or they might give you a chance to, to circumvent them, right? As you're rolling, you have to slot in some dice and depending on how many players, it's usually one die per player and it, and it, uh, sort of like you successfully defend the event. Some of the events are great, and some of the events really add to this sense of dice triage. Dice games, when done well, let you look at a set of results, whether this is in real time or uh, asynchronously, and decide what to do with your dice. Well, this die could be used for this, but it could also be used for this other thing, and I don't really know where I want to do this. And some of the events really add to this, because when you sock aside a die for to, to satisfy an event, it's not coming back to you until the end of the two-minute round. And that may not sound like much, but you're effectively giving up a quarter of your effectiveness for the remainder of this round. And so the natural impulse in many cases is, well... I'll just hang on to it for now. I'll get to it later. And of course, I'll get to it later is the rallying cry of a bad turn in Project Elite because suddenly the two minutes are up and you've never, you haven't gotten done what you wanted to get done. But some of the events I find really unpleasant. Like, for example, one of the events is for, for as long as this, this event is active, your character abilities don't have any effect. And if you're going to have a game, especially for something like Simon, with a whole bunch of cool asymmetric character powers, don't nuke it for a substantial portion of the game, especially since the events will trigger before you can get to them. There's going to be necessarily a round where that happens. And so some of the events just seemed like unfun to me. Oh, how about the one that's all clear with a smiley face emoji? <laughs> that took a lot of effort. And this all being said, there's and there's also a bunch of scenarios. You can play them on any board. So you can pick your board and pick your scenario, and they all work together. And Mark, like Mark just talked about, there are tons of characters to choose from, all with, like he said, their own unique power. So not only do they have their own ability, but they all have like a hit point track along the top. And like we also were just talking about, you're going to be rolling four dice during your turn. And on their cards, depending on how much damage you take, you could have one of those dice permanently locked unless you get healed. And I thought that, that that was in the old rules, but I still think it's a great little mechanic. It is nice. And I have to say that while you're playing the game, in the middle of those two-minute timed rounds, the experience is very tense and enjoyable. It's very intense in point of fact. And honestly... What you're doing much of the time, much of the time you need something, you need to get something very specific done. Like, for example, at the very beginning of the game, especially if you're playing on a map that doesn't have anything for you to search at the beginning in your base, the only results you want are move results, effectively. And so, basically, if, if you break it down atomistically, for, for many of the moments of the game, all that you're doing is you're checking a bunch of dice looking to get a six or a five, whatever, whatever specific result you're looking for. And the fact that that ends up being super enjoyable, engaging, and intense is really something, and it is very fun. It, it's like a kind of magic. And there's this tension as you see the alien slowly encroaching because the bad results mandate that you move an alien. And at that point, it's just a mad dash because you 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 know you can't grab the first alien you see, but you have to make a split-second decision about what alien to advance because if they hit your base, you lose. And that part, those elements and those panicked instant decisions are, I think, Project Elite at its best. Yeah, they did a fantastic job of not making the aliens difficult during your turn. Simply, if you roll an alien result on your die, they move, one, pick an alien, it moves one space. It doesn't matter what kind of alien it is, whether it's a boss or a runner or whatever it is, pick one, it moves one space. They don't do any abilities, they don't do any attacks. The only thing they might do is if you position yourself wrong and they happen to push you, because they have to move along a certain path that's detailed on the board. So if they happen to push a character, then that character takes one wound. Nice, easy, because you have a two-minute timer. You don't want to be bogged down by silly rules. What I wish it did better, though, was precisely that triage that I talked about in terms of dice games. Because most of the time, as I say, you're looking for a certain result. And the dice games that I really like, games like One Deck Dungeon, uh, recently Under Falling Skies, which was really engaging, even some roll and writes, where you're looking at your set of results and saying, hmm, should I do this or that with these individual dice? And far too often, I think, in Project Elite, it's just, I need this one result, I need this one result, I need this one result, and you keep rolling until you get it. Again, the fact that it works, the fact that it's so tense and enjoyable in those contexts is a bit amazing, but I wish there were a little bit more of those split-second priority decision-making that would, I think, have really elevated the game. 
But I think what I wish there was is I think with the two minute timer, I think it pulls back from a little of the interaction because you don't really have time to talk about any stretch. You really, I guess, during the alien tournament, I guess you're supposed to be talking about strategy and stuff. But I wish, you know, there could be a little more interaction during that two minutes, you know, saying, okay, I'll all clear this. There's really no time to talk. If you're not rolling dice, then you're not getting the most out of your turn. That's my other big criticism of the system. The co-op aspect is not really emphasized. The most that you'll ever encounter, generally speaking, in, in our experiences is you'll get in someone's way by accident. And then someone will just yell at you and say, get out of my way, I need to go somewhere. And that's about it. Mostly at the top of the round, you look at the board state before the timer starts and you figure, well, I guess I'm going in this direction and I guess you're going in that direction. And if we get the results we need, I guess we'll work towards the objective. And that's usually about it. With the occasional sprinkling of, okay, this boss needs to die before we do anything else. But at that point, again, you're just chucking the dice. You get the move results you need, and then you're just activating weapons as fast as you can, and then chucking the dice results as fast as you can, which, again, is enjoyable. But in terms of really good co-op game design, not necessarily optimal. And I this is a comparison I'm going to make several times. It really stands in stark contrast to Space Alert. Space Alert being the brilliant real-time co-op game where cooperation is a necessity. That's That, to me, is co-op gaming at its best because you can't get everything done by, done by yourself. Two people killing a boss in Project Elite is just twice as fast as one person killing a boss. There's no requirement. Whereas many threats in Space Alert literally cannot be dealt with with a single person. And those are some of the great moments of tension where you look across the table while the clock is ticking down and you're trying to coordinate with somebody else and trying to get them on the same page so you can coordinate your timing and get everything done and truly cooperate. And you don't really get that in Project Elite, and it's unfortunate. It's true. I, I, I can see where a comparison. You might want to force a comparison. They, you know, they're both force a comparison. Well, I'm just saying. I think they're just this two... from Fuji Koro is basically yeah, Mage Knight. I just think they're two very different games, in my opinion. This is just like a plastic stomping, shoot the aliens and go with it. There is a there is a lot of strategy in Space Alert. There's a lot of planning, and I think it, it, there's just a lot more there than there is in. Project Elite. The quality that I find in Project Elite, the thing that I like, is the tension, is the impetus of speed introduced by the timer, and the split-second triage decisions that that timer imposes on me. And I get all of that exactly, plus the requirement for coordination, and plus an additional strategic element in Space Alert. That's the comparison I'm making. Not a comparison that says that two games are basically the same because they both have hexes. No. (laughs) Touche, sir. Okay, so anyway, you talked about the weapons. I want to just talk about that very quickly. The weapons are very very interesting. There's tons of different weapons that you can get in the game. You're going to start with a basic weapon, and like you already said, there's these either there could be search points in your base or just outside your base. You go out and you find more weapons because this is what happens in these games. There's just weapons lying around. But I think I I think it's a, a neat mechanic. You have a weapon card, and there's specific dice. It's usually a gun die and some other sort of die. You have to slot in there, and once you have it filled, you get to roll some dice, and it'll tell you how many dice you get to roll, how far it can shoot, and what, and I and what you need to hit. And you could roll. It could just need one gun symbol. So if you roll three, you could fire it three times in a row. And I just think it's a very interesting way to cycle your dice through. It gives you more outlets for using more kinds of results. And in that sense, it's very important in the early game to get some better weaponry because your basic weaponry sucks. And that's another way in which I I feel that the game is a little bit awkward. The best items and the best weapons are alien technology, and you get those by killing a boss. And whoever deals the last hit on a boss is the one that gets the pull. Now, you don't tend to get that sort of degenerate competition like you might get in a game of Zombicide, because we we, we both know that Zombicide at its worst, if you don't pull the right weapons, you're going to be useless. And so you're milling through a deck trying to find something that works for you. But it is a little bit awkward that the throughput of alien technology is a little bit arbitrary, doesn't necessarily come in when you need it, and only goes to one person when they get the last hit. But I do concede that getting new weapons is cool, but at the same time, it's, uh, in my experience, most of the time, you're only ever using your best gun. If there were more specialized weapons, where, again, you'd roll your dice and figure, oh, do I want to use this gun or this other gun? They both have different strengths and weaknesses. Eh, Usually, whatever gun you find is going to be better than the gun you already have. And so you just end up using that over and over. So it's nice, but again, doesn't have as many trade-offs that I, I would really appreciate. 
the objectives that you have to go out and find. It's usually almost every mission is the same. You're going to go out to a certain point where we've put a square token. You're going to have to fill it with some dice. And then before the eight turns is up, you're going to have to get back to the base. That's the pretty, well, the impetus of all of the missions. But for whatever reason, even though it's the same square chit that's out there and you're doing the same thing, I really feel that every scenario has that feel of what you're doing. It's like going out and trapping aliens or going out and, and fixing this piece of technology before, you know, or, you know, it's, it's exactly the same, you know, square token, but you know, the, the theme is there and the feeling of what you're doing, I find every time is, is there. Yeah, the variety of the scenarios is surprisingly effective, I think. The two that I like the most are the ones where you have to trap an alien, you load up a square with the four particular dice that it needs, and then you have to hope that an alien is in the right place, which is easier than you might think because, again, the bad results force you to move an alien. And there, are, there's, a, there there's more coordination involved where people say, nobody move this alien, this needs to be trapped. Similarly, the scenarios where you they're called recon you have to drag a scenario tile back home and every time you suck aside a die it moves the objective one space those i find especially dynamic because again the objectives are moving it's not a question of just pushing into enemy territory and accomplishing objective you push them into enemy territory and you're doing this fallback maneuver so yeah the, the the variety in scenarios is cool the variety in character powers is cool but i have to say and i'll, I'll use this as a segue I'm really disappointed with most aspects of the physical presentation of this reprint. I have been a fan of Coleman or Not for many years, and usually you can count on their products being of high quality and high uh, and, and a large quantity of high quality materials. And I have to say that in terms of the quality of the cardstock, the quality of the graphic design, the variety of the graphic design, the rules errors, I I'm very, very disappointed. And also just in terms of the visual sameness of everything. You know, you have not Cable fighting a not Krogan, and it just seems very derivative sci-fi. You know, the, the guy who looks like he's ripped straight out of Aliens, definitely a colonial space marine. And they've always done that in the past. They've always had the sort of parody characters. But for some reason, the sheer volume of it with the sameness of the graphic design and the relatively poor nature of the components has left me disappointed. And... Honestly, the it's it, the quality of the miniatures is higher than what was the original Artipia version, and the, and the number of different characters is much much higher than existed in the Artipia version. But I was expecting more out of Kumi or not, based on my experience with their past project, and I confess that I'm somewhat disappointed. I'm not saying mine is the opposite, but I I I saw no problems with what I got. That's for sure. Tons of detail, tons of miniatures. I didn't want them too too. Uh, because you're you're moving them very quickly, you don't want them too f fragile or brittle or sharp or anything. Because you're fairly well throwing them around the board as quickly as possible. So sure, my, my my complaints aren't on that scale. In terms of the miniatures, I don't really have much in terms of complaints, except for the fact that in my copy, not in your copy, from what I could see, a bunch of my miniatures had white stress marks over them from where they were clipped from a sprue. But that could just be my that could just be the vicissitudes of my particular copy. The last thing I want to talk about during the turn is that. There's a very cool uh, sort of strategy or mechanic or decision making is where you just stop rolling dice. You even you have you know 60 seconds left, but you just look at the board and you can see you're just going to do worse off by rolling the dice further. You just stop and just wait for the alien turn. And I thought that that sort of trade off I thought was kind of interesting sometimes. Usually it's less than 60 seconds. You know, oh, yes, to give yeah, them credit. Yeah. You're not sitting out half the round usually, no, but no, yeah, no, yeah, usually it's 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 a function. And again, that 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 tension is often good. Forcing yourself. One of those moments that I always talk about where you have to take a step back from the game state and realize what's going on. You know, there's 15 seconds left, and you figure, well, I could do this thing but probably it's going to cost more than it's worth i need to take a break and just say that i'm done and and just call it for now which can be hard in the middle of a real-time experience agreed so after the two minutes are up then it goes to an alien turn and then you just go down the line you, you get to choose as i love these games where they don't bog you down on all these you know rules on what order to move things in you get to decide nice and easy you're going to move the aliens they all do what they do you know runners move fast and shooters shoot their people and then I like how the bosses all have their very unique abilities. They all sort of are very thematic. They're all different. And I, I really, f I don't feel as though it, this bogs the game down too much. I think it moves fairly quickly, spawning the figures on if they activate or if they don't. And then you're right back into your, your timed turn. 
A game like this really have, has to move quickly. You have to have the two minutes of actual gameplay, and if there's too much maintenance at the end of the round or the top of the round, it's going to suck all the momentum out of the game, and people are just going to get tuned right out. And to its credit, Project Elite does not do that. It keeps the tempo up. Very little is going on, and you're right that the systems mostly automate themselves, with one exception, and this is this is very primarily a preference issue. Just to flag it in case anyone's like like me. I've talked before that I don't really like spatial puzzles. And there's an aspect of moving the aliens, not in the middle of the two-minute rounds. In the two-minute rounds, you do not have enough time to engage in this kind of nonsense, and you're only moving aliens one at a time anyway. But when you are spawning aliens and moving them en masse at the end of the round or at the top of the round, there's this aspect of mathing out the paths to minimize the extent to which they push each other, to eke out one or two squares of more breathing space for you that is very much about re- looking at the board and calculating out a series of combinatorics. Okay, so the runners move three spaces, but then the biters move two. So if I move this runner over here, that gives more space for these biters to go over here. And that part, A, I'm really bad at it, and B, I really don't like it. Uh, it feels artificial. It really emphasizes the extent to which you as the player are controlling the bad guys, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense and, and kind of breaks the thematic immersion. And it really leans on those skills of spatial puzzle solving and of pathing and of, of, of root generation that I do not enjoy in board games, but many other people do. Agreed. I like how all the different spawns are different in that when you are going out during your two minutes, there is incentive to kill other ones before you kill... You know what I mean? Like get rid of the shooters or, you know what I mean? It's not just killing, you know, blindly. You're actually, sometimes you're picking out certain ones or, you know, moving them in certain ways to make it. There is some strategy there in how you, you know. Absolutely. And there's also strategy in leaving enough aliens alive because if you've killed all but one of them, that one alien is going to be moving lightning fast because every result that every player gets is going to move that specific alien and you might lose in an instant without even realizing what happened. Agreed. So... To kind of sum up, I, I think it's, I think, I hope I've made it clear that I enjoy Project Elite. It's fun, it's tense, it's engaging. I've never regretted any of my plays, except I think that in terms of real time games, especially real time co op games, it's not my favorite. I would play it over Space Alert in particular because it scales better. Space Alert is effectively a four or five player game. You can play it with three, and indeed there are rules for one and two, but I, I wouldn't do that. Project Elite is much better for two and three players. Solo is a bit wonky. You have to pick the right characters because otherwise you start losing dice and they get socked away really badly. And eh, some you can end up in an unwinnable situation very easily in the solo rules. They don't seem especially well thought out, but it's functional. And it is easier to explain. If you've got gamers that don't really have a lot of throughput for, for rules explanation, then yes, Project Elite is more approachable than Space Alert. But when you yeah, compare- that, that was the point that I was going to make earlier, was the fact that it's you can get into a game of, of Project Elite much quicker than you can of Space Alert. That is absolutely true. But I think that the payoff is much, much lower. Oh, yeah, in terms of cooperation, in terms of strategy, in terms of all those things, I think Space Alert definitely earns its weight. And there are other real-time games that I think are equally approachable that I think I borderline prefer to Project Elite as well. The Stellar Conflict by Artipia Games, that game that was based on light speed, where you're putting out rocket ships and they're firing. Very, 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 very different game. A competitive real-time game, but very, very quick, very engaging. Escape Zombie City, the zombie version. I almost never prefer the zombie version to the normal version, but I think that Escape Zombie City is a preferable co-op game to Project Elite in a lot of ways. And then there's Vengeance with the timed version. Vengeance, I think, is also a preferable game to Project Elite. So I really enjoy it. I've never regretted any of my time with Project Elite, but there are a series of niggling problems that really pull me from from fully appreciating the design. When those when that timer is running, and by the way, I will give props in terms of physical design. They included an, elect, an electronic timer in the box. I'm so thankful. There's also an app, but I really like kitchen timers. I don't know why, and I don't like the sort of quote unquote atmospheric elements and soundtrack and 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 background music of, of your of your game app. So I'm I'm glad to dispense with that. When the timer's running, I'm having a good time. When the timer's not running, I find it a little awkward and tedious and emphasizing skills that I don't enjoy. And I do wish that in addition to the tension of just trying to roll a six and a D six, it has some of those deeper elements. But Project Elite is still very enjoyable with all of those caveats. Yeah, I think it's a great way to bring new gamers into the hobby. Like for video gamers, this is a great gateway game. You know, it's a very action-packed, fast-moving game. You know, it's not, you know, sit down and thinky like, you know, throw them in front of a Euro or, you know, 
first game of Space Alert probably not would be a great idea, you know, for someone's first game. I don't. I'm not trying to throw Space Alert. Don't get me wrong. You make me pick between the two. I don't know. Project, I'm not making you do Project, Project Elite just went out the window. Space <laughs> Alert, fantastic game. We've always said if you haven't played Space Alert, give it a try. Anyway, I'm just going to go over these expansions super fast. Alien Rescue Expansion has all these different map tiles. You're like you're fighting inside an alien uh, ship. I think that would be best played with another expansion, which is the ammo pack. We've talked about how you shoot. The, what the ammo pack does is actually give you ammunition. So every time you shoot, you, you know, you're going to use up ammo and you have to go back and get more ammo. I think it would be painful and awful to play with that rule. But I think with the alien ship rescue, like sort of like squad base, you know, you know, aliens going through the corridors, I think that would, uh, work into it. There's one, another one called Death Mob Valley where there's this giant tremors type worm going down the you know, center of the board and you're trying to do all this damage to it. And last but not least, there is the Rook team where you have these giant Terminator like body suits and they're, you know, you're super armored and you have, you know, you're already built up with your weapons. Very interesting. All sorts of extra content for Project Elite. We wanted to try the Death Mob expansion, but we weren't able to. Yeah, well, we talked about uh, the rules being a bit off with the health and I've been reading through and people have been uh, talking about how their death maw is not going together correctly. I wanted to play death maw, but I've got two packs of small cards and I'm missing my pack of big, big cards. So I don't... So before when you said you had no complaints about any of the stuff that you'd received in your copy, was that a lie? No, because I, I didn't receive them, so I couldn't have any complaints about them. Fair enough. You got me there, Walker. <laughs> so that's going to do it for this week. Thank you very, very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. He's basically like Mage Knight. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at the games you like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236. Which is just like Splendor. And you can find us on Patreon. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigman. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>